One of the primary reasons that I believe that the first Easter actually happened is because the story you just heard doesn't add up. The reason, the primary reason I am waging all my chips on Jesus Christ and what happened on the first Easter is exactly because the story you just heard does not add up. You may go, well, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is that we human beings are always confusing facts with story, facts with a narrative. And if we want to understand what happened on that first Easter morning, and if we want to understand what's going on in our nation right now and all the things we see going around us, we've got to re-see, re-learn the difference between facts and narrative. Facts are small little details about an event that have no meaning, no meaning in and of themselves. They just are. A narrative or a story is when human beings come along and try and make sense of those facts. And so they arrange them in a certain way and they look at everything. Well, that's not really important. That's not significant. That's important. And they arrange the facts until they have a beginning, a middle and an end. And then they look back and then they say, now I get it. Now I understand. Now I see what happens. Now I understand the meaning of the event. And here's the key. Every narrative, every story you've ever heard is simpler than the actual reality. Why? Because it never includes all the facts. And you might say, well, wait, I would think if it was a good and true story, it would include all the facts. I know, but guess what? It can never happen. Why? Let's say, and for those of you at home, you can think about this. We're going to describe in a story what's happening right now. In this moment between you and me, what are the facts? Well, Langdon, it's pretty easy. Uh, today's Easter, and we've all gathered in this church, and we're listening to the pastor, and we're hoping he doesn't go too long. That's it. That's what we're doing. Well, those are all facts. Those are real facts. But let me tell you some other facts that are happening right in this moment. Did you know in the seventh pew back there under the left-hand side, there's some bubble gum stuck? Did you know that there's a small tear in the carpet here? Did you know that the pastor forgot to brush his teeth this morning? And the pastor's wife is saying, that's a fact, that's a fact. No, these are all details and facts. And you might say, well, that has nothing to do with it. Oh, so you're saying those facts are insignificant. So you see, anytime we tell a story, we never tell all the facts. Because if we told all the facts of something as small as this moment in this place, you'd all die of dead age. You'd, you'd die of old age before we ever finished describing what is happening in this tiny little moment? Now, the trouble is, we human beings, this is how we understand the world, is through story. So a good, true story can be life-changing. It can be the most beautiful thing in the world. It encourages you. It opens up vistas for you. But a bad story, a bad narrative, propaganda, will deceive you. Deceive you. And terrible, terrible things happen when people believe propaganda. You see, the problem is there are bad narratives, bad stories. And what's the difference between a true story and propaganda? Well, that's actually kind of a hard question, but I'll tell you one thing for sure. A bad narrative intentionally ignores crucial facts that are inconvenient for the narrative you're trying to say. When we have a bad story, when we have a propaganda, there's crucial facts, but we're going to ignore those because we want to direct your mind in a certain way. Because we human beings like a simple narrative. It's got to be simple. It's got to be step by step. It makes sense. Therefore, I believe it. So don't confuse me with a bunch of stuff. And so what we do when we tell a story, we have all the facts point in one direction. Okay, so let me give you an example of why this is so bad. From my own, this is a failure in my own life. I'm going to give you an example in my life when I believed a narrative that was too simple. Okay, here it is. I want to live a long time. I want to live a healthy life. And I am convinced that we are eating way too much processed food. And I believe that if I live a natural life and I spend more time exercising and getting outside, perhaps rock climbing, and if I eat natural food and if I eat organic food, it's going to be better for me and I'm going to be healthier and I'm going to live longer. 
And so I get all that, and so I'm trying to make changes in my diet. So I actually look at ingredients now. I pay attention. And for me personally, you know, if it's highly processed sugar, I'm trying to stay away from it because I don't think it's great. And thanks to my daughter, I'm trying to actually learn to like kale. I'm trying. I'm trying. Now, here is where my narrative has inconvenient truths, alternative facts that it is ignoring, and therefore it can actually not only be wrong, it can actually be dangerous for me. So we've got these two cavemen listening to the police go by, and the two cavemen are hanging out in their cave, and they're having a grand old time, and one of them says, wait, wait, something's not right. Something's not right. Our air is clean. Our water is pure. We all get plenty of exercise. Everything we eat is organic. In fact, it's all free range, and yet nobody lives past 30. You see, that's it. Alternative fact. It shows you that my little narrative, if I'm just natural and everything's natural and I just do that, it's going to be better. No, there's, there's other things going on. You see, the alternative facts that, that I left out of my overly simple narrative are things like if we didn't have modern science and if we didn't use some modern technology and chemicals and medicines, many of us would already be dead. And you see, my, my, my story, there's more to the story than I care to admit. And this is also true about the most important facts that our country is facing. This very week, brothers and sisters, this very week, and the weeks to come, our nation has to face and deal one more time with the heartache and the horror of the killing of George Floyd. And there's gonna be a prosecution and there's gonna be a defense. And both of them, both of them are gonna be tempted to tell you an overly simple narrative. The one side is gonna say, these are the really important facts and that stuff over there, that has nothing to do with the issues that are here. And the other side is gonna say, oh no, no, these are the really important big ideas and those details, that has nothing to do with what is really important here. And so we need to pray. We need to pray that true justice will be done. Not my idea of what is just, with all my prejudices, not your idea of what is just. With all your prejudices? No, what God says is just. The God who loves every human being on this planet, who says every single person's life is of the same value and it is precious. That is the justice. Let us pray that God's sense of justice and fairness is done in this case. And so the point is, my brothers and sisters, whether the leader is in politics or it's the owner of a company or it's someone with a social movement or it's just a marketer trying to sell us stuff, they're all tempted to sell an overly simple narrative that's really clean, it has no loopholes, and they tell us to ignore all those other facts, so we'll just go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. All right, well, what does any of this have to do with Easter morning? Absolutely everything. Let's look at what the leaders and the reasonable people did before and after the event of the resurrection. It's exactly what leaders do today. So we, we read in Matthew 27, 62 to 64, before the resurrection, they said this, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate, sir, they said, and in the Greek, it's like, Lord, like they're ingratiating themselves to the power that be to get him to do their bidding. They're like, sir, we remember that while he was alive, that deceiver, Jesus, said, after three days, I will rise again. So, so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. So what are they doing? They're getting ahead of the story. What do leaders do? We get ahead of the story. Think about, it. what does that mean? That means we're gonna spin a certain narrative before another narrative can be spun that leads you in another direction. We gotta get out in front of the story, lift up these facts, ignore these facts, so we get everyone pointing in the direction that we want them. Well, that is exactly what they did. They were trying to think ahead. They were trying to make a plan. We don't want the masses 
changing the status quo. We don't want people actually thinking there's a whole different way to live here. We've got to keep a lid on this situation, but you can't keep a lid on Jesus. And Easter morning came and now the tomb is empty and now they have a problem. So what do they do? What do leaders always do in a case like this? We have a back room meeting. So after the event of the resurrection, Harry read for us in Matthew 28, when the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. Money is always involved. Telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble because you're not supposed to sleep on the job, especially when you're a guard in front of the tomb. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And to this very day, it has been widely circulated. This story has been circulated to this very day. You see, they got out ahead of the story. They created a reasonable fiction. This is what you need to do. You need to create a narrative that has no holes in it. Because if there's any holes, any blank spots, people are going to say, wait, 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 but what about that? So you have to come up with something very simple and tight that people can understand. That's how you make it work. You need to stay on message. You ever hear people who are guilty and they're like, look, we got to get our story straight. What do they mean by get your story straight? They mean only say the talking points and don't bring up any of those alternative facts that could make people interpret it in a different direction. That is exactly what they were doing 2,000 years ago. And notice that last phrase, the story has been widely circulated to this very day. Why? Because it, it's the, exactly what we want to hear. It makes so much sense. This is just a religious myth. The, the disciples stole the body. You see, it, it already resonates with, with what we already want to believe, which is people don't rise from the dead. And further, we don't want to believe it because if Jesus really rose from the dead, it means he's the son of God, which means he's God himself, which means his laws, his morality is ultimate authority. And who wants that? Who wants Jesus's authority impinging on my freedom? I want to be a self-made man. I want to believe I'm in control of my destiny. But if there really is a maker of heaven and earth and Jesus is him, man, that really starts to get in the way. So this is a very convenient thing to believe. And you see, if I do believe it, then I don't have to wrestle with these questions anymore. I don't have to struggle with these issues anymore. I can just say, oh, it's just a religious myth. And, and I can just put it aside. But here is the problem. Here is the problem. The very people who say that to me, the very people who tell me that this didn't really happen, that uh, the disciples made it up, that you really can't even trust the Bible anyway because it's, you know, copy after copy after copy. It's exactly those people. The people that tell me it's just a religious myth, the people that tell me they just made it up, the people who tell me it's just copy after copy, they're the very ones who cannot explain this story to me. They're the very ones who have to give an account to me because their narrative is too simple. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Think about it. Just think about it. What is the very center of the Christian belief? What is the very most important claim? That Jesus physically resurrected from the dead. Paul himself says, look, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and he doesn't mean metaphorically, he doesn't mean spiritually, he means if his physical body did not physically rise from the dead, then our preaching is useless and your faith is in vain. In other words, the very center of this whole religious idea, all of Christianity comes down to one event, the resurrection, the actual moment of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, if you were creating a new religion and you wanted to convince people that it was true, what's the number one thing you'd need to describe and make all kinds of evidence for and make it a realistic narrative? The moment that Jesus rose from the dead. But what do the gospels give us? An empty tomb. No, no, if you wanna make a good story, 
If you want to make a good story, you don't do that. You tell people, here's what happened, and then here's what happened, and at this moment, he rose. You know, if I was telling the story, I'd say, there came the moment when the cave, the tomb was filled with heavenly light, and there was the sound of trumpets, and Jesus opened his eyes and got up and left. But what did they give us? An empty tomb. No, no, no. If I was telling the story, I'd have witnesses, credible witnesses there at the moment, because this is the moment. What do they give us? An empty tomb. All four Gospels. They give us this big question mark. Can you realize how easy this would have been to fix? All you got to do is just smudge it a little bit. All you got to do is is just include a few things. Now, what I'm going to include right now is my static guard. Because what you're hearing right now is me staticking. I know, you're like, man, we're seeing all kinds of special effects here today. This is, this is far more than I paid for to come here to church. <laughs> but what they gave us is not what we wanted. We want to see the moment. And they give us an empty tomb. You see, what they were supposed to do is give us a narrative that's step by step and makes sense with no loopholes in it. And what do they give us? A giant hole. Literally a giant hole, an empty tomb. Nobody sees it happen. How easy would it have this to be clean up? Get our ducks in order. Let's just take those manuscripts and add a few little details. Let's just round the edges, especially if we're making copy after copy after copy. This is so easy to fix. You guys, they don't. Instead, they show us an empty tomb. And now it gets even worse than that. Do some of you know there are apparent discrepancies between the four gospels? The gospel of Mark says there was a young man at the tomb. Matthew says, no, no, he wasn't a young man. He was more than that. He was an angel. John and Luke say, actually, there were two angels. Why are there discrepancies? Wait a minute. That that sounds, well, let me ask you a question. Do you think the ancient church didn't know there were discrepancies between the gospels? Do you think they were so dumb and primitive that we smart people later on, like, hey, look at that. There's some problem. Are you kidding me? These were some of the most brilliant people who ever lived. The ancient Christians memorized these gospels. They knew them word by word. They could tell you more than any scholar today. This one's different from that one. This one says this. Well, then why did they leave them the same? Why didn't they all get their act together and, and keep on message? Why didn't they clean it up? It would have been so easy, especially copy after copy. We can clean this up. Why didn't, and it gets even worse, you guys. If you were trying to convince people this really happened in that century, in a a traditional, patriarchal, oppressive culture, who are your testimonials going to be? Who are your witnesses who are going to declare that they saw Jesus rise from the dead? Who are they going to be the people who, who tell everyone else he is risen? Men. Men. Do you know in that time, women literally and legally we're not considered trustworthy witnesses compared to men. Now, here's the thing. We know that's stupid. We know that's gross. But those guys weren't writing 2,000 years ago for us. They had no idea we'd be here. They were writing for the people of their time. And in their time, they wanted to see a man, and hopefully a man with name and maybe some land, stand up and go, I saw it. You guys, this is the worst marketing effort in the world. This is a public relations disaster. Why in the world is it this way? And why has it been this way and never been changed? It's almost as if they said, we're going to let these four witnesses' testimony stand because every person never includes all the facts. And so the facts are going to be somewhat different in these four witnesses because that's what real witnesses do. It's almost like what they're saying is, we can't explain it. We don't know. We don't know how it worked. All we know is what we saw and what we experienced and we met him and our lives were changed forever. We don't know how it worked. So they leave us. They leave us with this big empty grave. Why don't they answer it? Why did they just leave us with this this incomplete sentence, this giant question mark? Why? And I'll tell you why. Because they will not choose for you. They will tell you what happened. 
They'll tell you what they saw, and then they're going to let you choose. They are not going to force an answer on you about the empty tomb, but they are going to force a choice on you. You got to answer the question. Why is the tomb empty? What do you believe actually happened? As for me, the longer I study the gospels and the more I study what happens to average ordinary people when they choose to build their lives upon one idea, one idea that Jesus actually rose from the dead, the more I'm convinced that the first Easter actually happened. I believe it is the most important event in the history of the world, an event that changes the way I understand everything, including my own life. But you might ask, okay, well, even if this all really did happen 2,000 years ago, what does that have anything to do with the way I see myself or my own life now? Well, here are some folks who do a really good job explaining that. While we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. While we were lost and alone, He became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, He embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, He became life and light to all. Our Shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, he gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, he displayed his power and purpose. While we stood accused, he accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, he gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, he accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for his blood has erased them entirely. No longer a slave, but an heir of salvation. You are his child, his chosen. You are his beloved. I know that there are many of you in this room this morning that would say the same as me, that I have experienced the love of this resurrected king. What happens when you build your life upon this one idea that Jesus really did rise from the dead? Good things begin to grow in you because the resurrected king is even now casting seeds of new life and new hope for anyone who will receive them, anyone who will take them in. And once you build your life on this one idea that Jesus really did rise from the dead, chains start to fall from your heart because you begin to believe the story, the only story that really matters, the one story you can trust, the story that God is telling you about the world, about you, about the meaning of your life. If Jesus really is risen from the dead, then it is totally reasonable to believe that even now, even in this very moment we are in together, in the midst of a crazy world where everyone is telling so many different stories, that right here, right now, Jesus is present with us, calling us to live life with him. And you know what the last thing he says in Matthew, the scripture that Harry wrote for, read to us this morning? 
The very last words that Jesus spoke in the Gospel of Matthew are the very last words of the entire Gospel of Matthew. Like Matthew saying, hey, if you forget everything else, remember this. The last thing he says is, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And when he says the end of the age, he doesn't mean the end of that age. He means the age of the physical universe. Like in every age, I will be present. I will be here with you. You see, in every age and every morning, he stands waiting for you to choose. What do you believe about that empty tomb? And what happens when you choose Jesus? What happens when you say, I'm gonna wage all my chips on this. I'm gonna take everything and bet it on Jesus. What happens when you surrender yourself to Jesus as the king of your heart? You begin to become the person you were always meant to be. Listen to what a modern atheist who encountered this resurrected king, C.S. Lewis, says about how to become real. He says this, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become. Because he made us, he invented us, he invented all the different people you and I were intended to be. He goes on, it is when I turn to Christ, when I give myself up to his personality, that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. And you know, I think he was about 40 years old when he finally came to that conclusion of figuring out how to be actually himself. So if you ask me to sum up everything I have learned so far in my almost 40 years now of walking with Jesus, it would be captured in this last quote from Lewis. This is what he says. Look for yourself. In other words, try and find yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. Think about our nation right now. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Well, how do you do that? How do you look for Christ? How do you pursue him? How do you encounter him? Well, I want to give you one simple, easy step you can take this very week. Commit to join us this spring on our journey through the gospel of Matthew. Every week, we're going to go chapter by chapter through the Gospel of Matthew, alone, at home, with our family, in our house. And as we do that, then we're going to come the next Sunday here, gather for worship, and we're going to dig further into one of the key revelations of that chapter together. And it's all going to be about Jesus. It's all going to be about encountering Jesus. Okay, but what if you would say to me this morning, Langdon, I want to believe I I want to, but I am just not feeling it. This morning, are you hurting? Are you struggling? Are you depressed? Are you brokenhearted? Are, Are you plain broken? If that is you, I want to show you a photograph that I found this week that has been really encouraging me all this week, even if it might look a little strange to you at first. Here it is. This is one of the oldest living things on earth. This is a bristlecone pine tree, and this one is at least a thousand years old. But it doesn't look like life has been very kind to it, does it? Look how tortured and scarred and bent it is over and over its branches being broken off and it it becomes this short stubby little thing but it's still alive if you saw this in the sunlight you'd see 90 percent of it is dead but there's still little branches of green still there it's still alive Outside it is wasting away, but inside it is being renewed day by day. Many parts of it are broken, but not all. So imagine that tree is you. Every hurt, every betrayal, every loved one that you have lost, every disappointment, every failure, every scar that has bent and beaten you. But you're not dead yet. 
In fact, like you're like that guy in a Mighty Python movie. I'm not dead yet. You're not dead yet. It's still living. It's a thousand years old. It's still living. It's still got something. It has so much more and it continues to live. And to me, it is beautiful and it's encouraging. In fact, my family once, just two, a couple years ago, we were out in the desert and we actually had lunch inside one of these trees and it offered us shelter from the desert sun. It was so beautiful. It was so encouraging. Your life can be a refuge and a blessing to others, no matter how many broken parts you have. You have a place in this world. Does that pine tree look lonely and forlorn to you? But notice all of heaven is its witness. Every star looking down, taking note of its existence, all its days matter. Every season it has gone through matters. It has a role to play in the story, the only story that matters, the story that God is telling. It is the story of the history of this world. Everything that has ever happened to it matters because it is God's. It is God's creation. What about you? God knows every hair on your head. He knows how important, how deep every one of your experiences is. You are not alone. And he knows what it's like to suffer. He once was broken upon a tree. His life looked like a disaster, but that was not the end of the story. Brothers and sisters, what is the empty tomb whispering? What is the heavenly host whispering? What is the entire cosmos whispering? Who is he? Who do you say he is? What happened in that tomb? Who and what is this resurrected king? Who is this one who is the witness to every moment of your life? He stands up in the middle of time and he declares in Revelation 22, I am both the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright morning star and he is present to every morning. He is present to this morning. He is the one who was and is and shall be. He is the Lord of life. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of your days. And what does he declare to you this Easter morning? Again, in Revelation chapter one, he says this, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and forever. His voice cries out across the ages this morning to you and me. And he says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. He will have eternal life. And then he turns and says to us the very thing he said to the woman at the well. Do you believe this? Do you believe this. This is what Jesus is asking you and me. This is what the empty tomb is asking you and me. This is what Easter morning is asking of us. Paul, standing in the light of that first Easter, cries this, I am suffering as I am, and yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him unto that day, the day when there's no more sorrow and no more tears and a new heaven and a new earth. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. And so I declare to all of you today, in fact, I ask you to declare with me out loud today, what the church has declared every Easter morning for 2,000 years, and we will keep on declaring this on Easter morning until that day that he comes again, the most important fact there is in my life. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.